we have put together, I think, the most extensive and inclusive voter fraud organization in the history of American politics. Greetings, my fellow freedom lovers and sovereign thinkers. Thank you for tuning in to the LO3 Podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful swampy mangrove of South Florida. And today's date is Sunday, December 6, 2020. Yes, tomorrow will be the anniversary of the horrific event that happened in Pearl Harbor. And it's been proven that uh, President Roosevelt had prior knowledge in advance of what was going to occur. And he let it happen. So always got to look at the bigger picture, folks. On horrific events like that. However, we're going to be, I'm going to be actually narrating a uh, nice uh, blog here. Article that was written by the pen name of Publius Huldas is a Publius Huldas blog. Dot WordPress dot com came out yesterday to be exact, and it's entitled "A Constitutional Roadmap for Conquering Voter Fraud." As it reads here, the following shows what state legislators and each branch of the federal government have the authority to do to address the monstrous crime which has been committed against our country. Number one, Article 4, Section 4, U.S. Constitution. The fundamental principle which should guide us in dealing with the issue is set forth at Article 4, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution. It reads, The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. The essence of a republic is that sovereign power is exercised by representatives elected directly or indirectly by the people. Election fraud strikes at the heart of our constitutional republic. Therefore, Congress, the federal courts, and the executive branch, i.e. the United States, have the duty imposed by Article 4, Section 4 to negate the fraud in order to preserve our Republican form of government. As shown below, the states also have authority to remedy the election fraud committed in their state. Number two, the constitutional framework governing federal elections. These are the clauses in the U.S. Constitution everyone should study. Article 1, Section 4. It is times, places, and matter clause. It means whatever it says. Federal and state judges and federal and state executive agencies have no authority to tinker with election laws made by the state legislators or Congress. When they tinker with the laws, their acts are usurpations and must be treated as such. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2. The President and Vice President are to be elected by the electors appointed in such matter as the state legislative legislators shall direct. So all those prissies out there that were celebrating on November 7th of this year, that Biden won, you've been uh, misconstrued. And I will um, carry on. Let me just see here. Yep. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 4. Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they vote. The 12th Amendment set forth the procedures for how the electors are to cast their votes for president and then for vice president. To our detriment, we have ignored those procedures for a long time. 
the 20th Amendment, Section 1, says the terms of President and Vice President end January 20th. And the terms of Senators and Representatives end January 3rd. And the Section 2 of the 20th Amendment says Congress shall meet on January 3rd unless they make a law setting a different rate, different date. Congress did make a law which changed the date to January 6th. That would be at 1 p.m., the joint session, joint congressional session. When they um, bring in the electoral college results and they could, Congress could accept it or reject it. Okay? <clears throat> Three, the statutory framework at Title Three U.S. Code sections one through twenty-one, Congress implemented the education, the constitutional provisions. Congress understood there would be fights in the states over se selection of the electors, so they provided for the fights. A. Title Three, U.S. Code Section 1, Congress set November 3rd as the date for appointing the electors in the states. But the next two sections addresses, addresses what happens when the electors are appointed on November 3rd. Section 2 says the electors may be appointed on a subsequent day in such matter as the legislator of each state may direct. And Section 3 says electors are chosen when any controversy respected their appointment has been finally determined. Determine the controversy is, of course, the purpose of a litigation and the hearings in state legislators. And here's B. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 4, U.S. Constitution gives Congress authority to determine the date on which the election votes. And says here, Title Three, U.S. Code, Section 7, set that date for December 14th, but Section 3, oh, a Title Three, U.S. Code, Sections 12 and 13, provide for what happens when Congress hasn't received the electoral votes by December 23rd. Okay, so... So what we see, that flexibility to deal with fights in the states over the selection of electors is built into U.S. code. See, now we get to the counting on the elector, elector's vote in Congress. Title Three, U.S. Code Section 15 says Congress is to meet on January 6th to count the votes. The President of the Senate which is, you know, Vice President Mike Pence presides. He is to call uh, for the objections to the votes. The rest of Section 15 and Section 16 through 18 deal with handling the elections in Congress respecting the electors' votes. So the statutory framework recognizes that selecting the presidential electors can get messy and that there would be fights over the electors in the states and in Congress. We are working through this process right now. Number four, Congress has the power to determine whether the president-elect or vice president-elect are qualified for office. Section three of the 20th Amendment shows that Congress has the authority to determine whether the president-elect and vice president-elect are qualified for office. If either is not a natural-born citizen, okay? If either is not a natural-born citizen, Congress has the power and the duty to disqualify that person. According, it was Congress' duty to inquire into whether Obama was a natural-born citizen, and today it is Congress's duty to inquire whether into whether Kamala Harris is a natural-born citizen. And here's the thing on this qualification. It, is, it can be clear an offense if you accept it as her being a natural-born citizen or her getting involved, okay, and accepting the position. 
it's a does breach Article One, Section Eight, Clause Nine of our U.S. Constitution, which pertain to offenses under the law of nations. It's not on. It's not on. Uh, on his document, okay, it's not on his document, but I'm giving you that. And if you look at the Law of Nations, Section Two Twelve, it explains in clarity what a natural born citizen is. So that's why when the framers, James Matheson and the, fr- and the framers, the founding fathers, used the Law of Nations as their guidebook as well. So it's always good to know these things, folks. Remember, the mainstream garbage media don't want you to know. Congress has also has the power and the duty to disqualify Biden and Harris on the ground that fraud bringing about their sham election was an attack on the state's rights guaranteed by Article 4, Section 4 to have a Republican form of government. Okay, so it can be, it is considered, you know, it can be considered a sham election. Congress can have that power. All right, so it says here, number five, election fraud is a crime. It is the duty of the Department of Justice to investigate and prosecute the election fraud. It is disgraceful that they have not done nothing. And hopefully, Lord Ass Bar is um listening to this show, okay? Or his lackey supporters and all that. It is a monumental deception for not investigating, okay? Number six, the duty of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is surely aware of the duty imposed by Article 4, Section 4, guaranteed to the states a Republican form of government where representatives are elected by the people, not by the corrupt politicians who pay for massive organized election fraud and cheating. While a Supreme Court obviously cannot enforce its own ruling, but depend on the executive branch of the federal government to enforce them, the Supreme Court must issue an opinion, okay, Consistent with Article 4, Section 4, which, when enforced by the executive branch of the federal government, solves the present crisis. They can have a merited viewpoint. And if if it goes in that direction, the joint, the con- in Congress, during the joint session, can u- utilize that, Okay. Can utilize it on the floor when the electors come in. Number seven, state legislators should appoint replacement electors. It is clear that state legislators have the power to ignore the fraudulent election and appoint a new set of presidential electors. Such is consistent with the Constitution and the statutory scheme laid out in Title Three, U.S. Code sections. 1 through 21. Furthermore, the Supreme Court has already acknowledged that state legislators may do this. Remember that Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2, U.S. Constitution says the electors are to be appointed in such a manner as the state legislators may direct. Originally, electors were generally chosen by the state legislators in McPherson versus Blacker, Decided 1892, the Supreme Court gives the, gave the history of how each state legislator chose their electors since the first presidential election. It was only later that state legislators began to provide for the popular election of the presidential electors. Congress expressly recognized that state legislators may re- resume at any time the power to select the electors. Remember that. Title III, U.S. Code, Section 2 says, Whenever any state has held an election for the purpose of choosing electors and has failed to make a choice on the day prescribed by law, the electors may be appointed on a subsequent day in such a manner as the legislator 
of such state may direct. Additionally, in Bush v. Gore decided 2000, the Supreme Court said that the state legislature's power to select a manner for appointing electors is plenary. It may, if it chooses, select the electors itself, and even after granting the franchise to the people to select the electors, state legislators can resume the power at any time. So yes, in states where the election was stolen, the state legislators may and should resume their plenary power to select the electors. America urges the state legislators to be bold and do the right and do what is right. Number eight. Warning. Republican establishment cowards who refuse to confront and defeat the election for fraud don't seem to understand the consequences of the refusal to man up and fight the fraud. Our country is right now in the process of being overthrown and taken over by profoundly evil people. We better fight while we still can. And there's plenty of footnotes you can look at here as well. So that's Papers 10. And of course, um, the 12th Amendment. And all that. And of course, um, whether or not President-elect or Vice President-elect meet con- con- call for, uh, qualifications for office is a political question for Congress to decide. And of course, uh, Fellas Papers 78. You should always read that, too. And you always go, always do a little more research, too, while you're at it, folks. And, um... Or so, and Polybius, how about, um, Habula did a, the blog is pretty cool. I always get his stuff, and he has the links to back it up. So it's merited, and I remember one time I posted something like that from his link from one of his sites, and someone tried to argue with me about it. I just laughed, because you got no merit. Invalid arguments. Try to give me a whole rant. And I'm like, Shh. It's like, be quiet. Well, it's funny about social media. You're always going to expect a genius out there, right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's very uh, nicely done. And um, so hopefully all you folks out there can um, share this. Either document if you want, but um, and go and do a little for, do a little more homework. See, an informed voter and citizen makes it more da- ma- ma- makes it more dangerous towards the tyrants because they want you to be dumb, stagnant, and happy. They want you, they believe you're just a bunch of confounded peasants and a number to them. And I just say. Give the big middle finger, far as I'm concerned. The tr- bottom line is this, folks. The more you know, the more you implement, the less you fear. Including your rights. And in being a formed citizen. And trust me. The mainstream garbage me don't want you to know that. And that will be it. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share throughout your social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or if you said something that's interesting, want to check out, whatever you do, please send your correspondence to the quorum. Furthermore, I will leave this footnote on my speaker page. If you want to contact me, hit me at um, lookyluck3 at gmail.com or lookyluck03 at protonmail.com. If you send a donation, you can hit me at paypal.me forward slash lookyluck3 and even support. Publius Hubdo's blog as well. Okay? Once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading love. And may your guardian spirits be with you.